I'm Scott Stripling, Provost at the Bible Seminary and Director of the Archaeological Excavations at Ancient Shiloh. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Craig Evans. Craig, it's hey. a pleasure to uh, sit down with you. Good to be with you, Scott. Well, you had a standing room only crowd. I thought it was like uh, being in Capernaum. They were going to bust to the roof to get people in there. <laughs> well, no one did come through the ceiling, so I, I, I got through it okay. <laughs> but we, we have people standing guard. Uh, the topic's so interesting, and people just love to hear about the relationship between Bible and archaeology. Yeah, they, re they really do. And uh, uh, what I was talking about, one thing was positive. The archaeological evidence, in fact, does uh, really clarify a lot of things, support a lot of things that the New Testament says. But also, you know, archaeology can be mishandled. Yeah, that's right. And uh, that's how I began. I, I wasn't trying to trash the legacies of a couple of well-known scholars, but to misappropriate the archaeology, get the chronology all messed up in right. different eras, it would be like, I suppose, uh, when you're an archaeologist, you're careful with your stratigraphy. You, that's your chronology as you sure. work your way down. Can you imagine going in with a rototiller first <laughs> and completely scrambling? Yeah. Your, you'd never do that. And yet we had New Testament scholars in the 1990s who were doing that with the archaeological evidence. They, they didn't mean to. They didn't right. know what they were doing. So I think it underscores the uh, importance of being careful and methodical right. and knowing the context, chronological context especially, so that when you say, well, here's what was going on in the time of Jesus, you're talking about the 20s and 30s of the first century. You're not talking about the third century. Right. So make sure the archaeological data you're talking about and trying to apply to the New Testament is the appropriate data. Right. You know, those artifacts, in particular the synagogues that you talked about, when we have scholars come along and say, well, there weren't synagogues in the first century, yet the New Testament says that they were, and we know that archaeologically they were, it takes us decades to undo that. Yeah, and one of the big takeaways, uh, this is why I encouraged uh, people to read Rick Bonney's recent work, is that um, there was an intensity mm. of Jewish devotion in the first century, and right. that would include especially Galilee. Synagogues that were being built, stepped immersion pools, mikvot, and other artifacts that attest to the devotion for the historic ancient Jewish faith. Right. And that actually stopped after 70. And it was, and that the archaeological evidence shows it's the opposite yeah, it's exactly of what opposite. some some yeah. scholars have assumed. It's like, oh well, they didn't get serious about their faith and start building uh, synagogues till after the temples destroyed. Actually, right. that's wrong. That, that, and, that's wrong. You know, Craig, it's gotten a lot worse since the uh, internet has, has come about. And you and I just co-wrote an article that comes out today in the Near East Archaeological Society Bulletin. And we're here at the NES uh, meetings. So we're looking to see our, our article in print today, hopefully. But talk about the internet going wild with, with conspiracy here. Did you know that the temple wasn't really on the Temple Mount? <laughs> well, I seem to remember Arafat saying it was in, you know, <laughs> somewhere else on the West Bank. <laughs> well, yeah, so we've got temple deniers and then we've got mythicists. Relocators. And relocators. We've got a bunch of stuff going on. Um, the, the crowd that we're sort of targeting in this are the revisionists. So just want to tell folks a little bit about our new article and why that's important. Yeah, I think it is important because uh, they're, they're are a few sources from antiquity that are just vague enough and idealistic enough that maybe you can make the case that the, uh, the temple was really a little bit down the hill and perhaps located over or adjacent to uh, the Gilman Spring. Spring. Sure. And, uh, and, and, and of course the motivation is, in a way it's almost admirable, the motivation is to make peace with angry Muslims. Mm -hmm and say, well, you can have the temple out because the temple really wasn't there. The temple is down here, which you guys don't care about. And everybody, we, you know, it's an ec ecumenical sure, nirvana. Sure. But it's, it's a historical distortion, and it's a complete disaster in the analysis of the archaeological evidence. And that's, we had to write yeah. that. Well, it's grown to the point where we've got millions of evangelicals who were influenced by YouTube videos and 
um, you know, so we sort of had to get it out there to set the record straight. Well, we do, because on the one hand, you have, you have mythicists and radical skeptics, and they want to say Israel didn't even have a history in this land, mm. they, there never was a kingdom, there never was a temple, and so they're arguing that, that there never was, it was even there. Right. And then you have well-meaning uh, evangelical scholars, oh, of course Israel has a history, and of course it's, 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 Jerusalem was Israel's capital mm. city, but the temple was somewhere else. The temple was down the hill somewhere else. So it's a complicated mess with, with people coming at it from all different angles. So we, we, had, to, we had to look at all the alphabet and, yes. and, and say, mean, what does it really show? So we went through the, the literary evidence, we went through the archaeological evidence, and then the biblical record. So hopefully that'll set the record straight, and uh, we'll see. I hope so. Yeah, and we're, we're going to work on a popular version of it, too. Yeah, that's right. I think that's what we need to do. And in fact, that's what will probably be the most effective part. Speak to the scholars, get the scholarly feedback, but then present it in a popular way so that a million internet people can get straightened out. I know, that's awesome. Let's uh, change gears and talk about this winter. We've uh, sort of like that James Taylor song in my mind, I've gone to Carolina. Uh, you know, I've already got my mind, I'm here in Fort Worth, but I've already got my mind on Jerusalem, and we're doing a very interesting project this winter. Yeah, we are, and it's ambitious, and we're going to trace the really the history, the whole story of the house of God as tabernacle and eventually as stone temple in Jerusalem. And I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to visit a lot of key places. There's a lot of interesting, supportive, archaeological and topographical data along right. the way. Uh, and, and some uh, leading um, archaeological people that we will interview. I, th I look forward to it. Well, you know, it's never been done. We're going to we're going to be tracing the route of the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle, and following through all of these movements, interviewing scholars on site, and folks have probably never heard of Gesher Media yet, but they will after this. Oh, I think so. I think it'll be a big hit. Uh, it'll be on television. Uh, it'll be aired a lot. A, uh, a well-known television personality, a movie star will be with us. Am I allowed to mention yeah, his name? I, you should. I should? Well, everybody knows about Hercules, right? Well, this is Kevin Sorbo yeah. I'm talking about. So, I mean, this is going to be intimidating to me. I'm going to have Hercules on my right and Hercules on my left. <laughs> and there are spindly old, worn out <laughs> Professor Evans in the middle. Oh, but we'll be catching the pearls of wisdom as they're yeah, falling from I, the sage's lips. I'm going to look at them as my bodyguards. <laughs> I, I'm in good hands. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun because the audience is going to be learning as we go through Kevin's eyes and through Kevin's voice. So you and I are the senior consultants on the project. and. We're having a blast because we get to bring in all these archaeologists and scholars and travel all of these places. But I think the audience is going to love seeing it through Kevin's eyes and hearing it through Kevin's voice. Yeah, I think so. And what the audience, uh, our audience might not know is that Kevin is a very committed Christian. Right. He's keenly interested in this. Uh, the pandemic problem, you know, went scheduling challenges. And it was funny how often I was emailed and phoned by Kevin Sorbo saying, now look, I, we're still doing this, right? I need you to do it. So he's in, he's in, he's all in. That's awesome. And it's gonna be a good time. Well, it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to visiting Shiloh, our dig site, and having you there with us for a few days and getting your hands dirty and sort of, you know, getting that, that context of where the tabernacle rests. Well, you know, Scott, your, your work at Shiloh is hugely significant. I think, I think you're right on the, on the edge of a major breakthrough in a strategic place. Shiloh is second only to Jerusalem in importance for early Israel. And, you know, if you're able to confirm that, you know, what tabernacle was in fact here, and here are sacrificial bones from that, even reaching back to the time of Samuel or earlier, that's going to be huge. And I'm glad we're going to be there. I'm glad the cameras will be rolling, and that'll become part of this very important documentary. Dr. Evans, thanks for taking a few minutes to visit with me today and look forward to sharing with you this time uh, in Israel this winter. Hey, you're very welcome, Blessings man. Blessings to you. Okay. All right.